Okay, so good morning, everyone. Welcome everyone again to the MISS seminars after the break that we had during the, during the summer. So it's my pleasure today to present Andrew Cavana, who is going to talk about simultaneous multi-scale measurements of ion drift in Earth or solar ionosphere. And we are actually, so we have been for a long time waiting for this presentation. So we invited Andrew really long ago. And I mean, I'm really, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing your, your seminar today. Thank so you. when when you want, just go ahead, please. <laughs> thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for um, listening to my seminar today. As Beatrice says, I'm talking about uh, multi-scale measurements of ion drift in the Earth's auroral ionosphere. Um, but there's a, a subtitle to that, um, which is how differences in the scale size of a measurement impacts our observations and our understanding of those observations. I think this is um, quite an important question and one that I think is going to get a lot more um, consideration um, as new instruments come online, which look at um, higher spatial and higher temporal resolutions. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that towards the end of the proposal uh, presentation. Um, for those who don't know me, um, I'm Andrew Kavner. I work in the Space Weather and Atmosphere team at BASS. And I'm also a member of the UK ISCAT support group. So I'm here to provide um, support in planning experiments, planning um, science campaigns, uh, interpreting ISCAT data, all that sort of stuff. If, if you need help with that, I can help. It's so that's part of my role. Uh, but this work today um, comes from several areas, uh, but I just want to particularly thank my co-authors, uh, uh, Yasunobu Ogawa from NIPR in Japan and uh, Emma Woodfield at BASS, um, who contributed to this work. So this has actually already been published. Um, so if you feel inspired by this presentation, go away and read it in, in more detail the, the work that it's based on. Uh, and the paper was published in JGR earlier this year. Um, and the title of the paper is Two Techniques for Determining F Region Ion Velocities at MISO Scales Differences and Impacts on Dual Heating. Um, and for this talk, um, here's the outline. I'm going to go into a little bit about the initial motivation for the work, the work I'm doing, then sort of take a diversion to talk about what the ionospheric electric field is and uh, the instruments that I use. Um, in this um, study, uh, no, namely the ISCAT radars. I'll then uh, go back and look at a little bit more motivation um, before delving into um, where the data came from, the actual observations that we, uh, we made and how they impact on the electrodynamics and the and gel heating. And then at the very end, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the future, which is the new ISCAT 3D radar um, and how that fits into the future of this sort of work. So the motivation was essentially twofold. Uh, I was part of a, a large highlight topic project called SWIG, Space Weather Impact on Ground-Based Systems. Um, part of my role in that was establishing the importance of the electric field in the contribution to geomagnetically induced currents. Um, and also comparing that to the to the conductivity, essentially looking at um, which is more important, the conductivity or the electric field in the formation of, of uh, GIC, and we were using uh, DH by DT from local magnetometers to as a as a proxy for the GIC. Um, and as a nice little spoiler, there's some some results from that that works um, being written up for publication and should appear soon. Um, but to do that, I needed to build measurements. Uh, I needed to take measurements of the electric field and the conductivity of the electric field to build the statistics up to really look at this, this issue. Um, so I was looking at ways of extracting the electric field. Um, and also in BAS, we have long been interested now in um, dual heating and its effects on uh, the neutral atmosphere, particularly because we're quite focused on the impact on um, satellites uh, and satellite drag and, and the space debris field in, in low Earth orbit. Um, and dual heating um, also depends on the electric field. So 
extracting some measurement of the electric field was was really important for the for two streams of work I was trying to do. Um, so very briefly, what is the ion spectral electric field? Well, it's I'm not going to go into details about what it is, but it, it's fundamental for understanding uh, ion spheric electrodynamics and the, and the coupling between the, the ionosphere and, and, and the magnetosphere. Um, these plots are not are simply there for illustration. Um, on the left hand side, you can see um, uh, current systems um, or, or proxies for current systems obtained from magnetometer measurements. And these currents are very dependent upon the, on the imposed ion, ionospheric electric field. And on the right hand side, you can see the uh, um, a convection map. It's actually, I think, particle tracing based on superdome data, um, where you see the twin cell convection, which is driven by the, um, by the electric field um, in the um, polar ionosphere. So it's a very important um, uh, parameter. Uh, and there are a number of ways that we can we can get measurements of the electric field. Um, one of the most obvious ways are in situ measurements using a variety of instruments on satellites such as um, Swarm. Uh, these are satellites in in orbits of um, several hundreds to thousands of kilometers above. Um, the problem with that is they provide sort of snapshots at a given position and time. But you can still build up statistics, and there's and, and I don't want to be dismissive. There's lots of ex excellent science been done with this these satellites. Um, some very good work um, from a ground-based perspective, which is what I usually take. I think that um, Superdome is one of the best ways of extracting an estimate of the global scale electric field. Uh, and here you can see the um, pretty shot of the um, Superdome antennas at Halley. Um, which actually aren't there at the moment. They're, they're currently at, um, um, at the Falkland Islands. Um, and you can see all the different countries that contribute. This is sl probably slightly out of date now. And they produce maps of, uh, of the convection pattern um, and the electric potential um, from which you can derive the electric field. Um, but it's very large scale measurements from, from very small scale measurements, but it, it's, it's a good way of doing it. Um, my favourite, for, for many reasons, is the IceCat radar. And, and what you can see here is the 32 metre mainland UHF dish. It's a fully steerable dish. Um, it turns in azimuth and in elevation, um, though it's quite slow moving. Um, and it's one of two radars on the mainland, the second one being the VHF, which you can see there. And also we have the large heating array nearby. Um, so this is in uh, Ramfjord Moen in uh, northern um, Norway, not far from Tromsø. Um, it's a beautiful spot. Um, I've been very fortunate to go up there a number of times to run experiment campaigns, and it's always been a lot of fun. But it's a very versatile instrument. Um, what I mean by that is you can extract a lot from it. It's only essentially a single point measurement, if you like, though it, I mean, it gives a, a profile, either in height or range, depending on how you point the dish. Um, but it provides a number of very useful ionospheric parameters with only a few um, assumptions. So, for example, here's um, um, just a random plot I grabbed. Uh, you can extract the, the plasma density, and here you can see the, the, the daytime F region. You can see lots of um, precipitation occurring over the, uh, the nighttime period. Um, you get the electron temperature, the iron temperature, and we can see strong heating going on here and here associated with these precipitation events. And you can get a measure of the iron drift velocity. And for um, a single beam radar, that's the line of sight velocity. That's the velocity up or down um, the beam. And if you want to learn more about um, the types of experiments that you can run, where you can vary the altitude range or the, the range gate size or the cadence of the experiments, ISCAT has a book of experiments which you can refer to um, if you want to plan an experiment to do something. It's very useful. Um, the three red dots here show the location of the of the ISCAT radars. And I'm, I say radars because over here at Thompson is, is the, uh, the transmitter and receiver of the UHF and the VHF. And here at Kirina and Sedankula, which are these two dishes here, there are actually um, remote receiver sites. Uh, and this introduces a capability um, which is 
also unique, I think, to um, ISCAT, which is that it is a tristatic radar. And what does that mean? Well, a tristatic radar means that you can point the receivers into a common volume with the um, transmit receive dish. And from that, you can measure the line of sight velocity in three directions and therefore compose an actual vector measurement. So you're not just looking in the line of sight of the radar, you now have a vector measurement at one position. It is limited at one position. I believe it's still the only radar in the world that can do this. It used to be the UHF. It's now switched to the VHF due to um, um, issues with mobile phones and, and radio um, locally in Tromsø, uh, which use the same frequencies. Um, but it's great. It provides very high time resolution data from seconds to minutes, at very small spatial scales. You know, range gates can be the order of one to several tens of kilometers, depending on the altitude you select, um, and roughly 10 kilometers um, horizontal scale, given the, the, the broadening of the beam. There are other ways you can extract velocity from ISCAP. Um, so one thing you can do, as I mentioned, the UHF dish is capable of rapid scanning. Well, perhaps rapid is not the word, but it's capable of scanning. Um, so you can actually turn the dish into three to four different positions over about 300 seconds. Um, and you dwell on each position for about a minute. And then you combine those um, velocities from different directions to give you your, your vector velocity. Um, the problem with this is it's it's moderately low time resolution. We've moved from you know seconds to minutes to to hundreds of seconds. Um, it's um, over a much larger spatial scale, depending on what your scan position is. The, the if you're looking in the F, F region, the difference between this point and this point can be so, um, over a hundred kilometers. Um, but it does provide height resolved measurements, which the tristatic can't do. I mean, in principle, you used to be able to scan up and down the beam, but that again, that compromised your um, temporal resolution. Um, but with the um, with the monostatic technique, which is what this is called, so this is the tristatic, this is the monostatic technique, you can actually resolve uh, velocity vectors at different heights. And there is some utility for this, particularly at the lower altitudes for extracting um, uh, neutral wind measurements. So down here where the collision frequency is very high, the, the motion of the ion sphere is a mixture of, of that driven by the electric field, the ion drift and the, the neutral motion. And by doing some very clever combinations of, of, the, of extracting the, the, the motion up here from the motion down here, um, you can actually get what the neutral uh, wind speed is, which um, I will talk a tiny bit about later because it's quite important for dual heating. Um, and this measurement is particularly relevant for other ISR and some of the techniques because um, although we have multi-beam ISR now, none of them have a tristatic capability, so they all use this sort of technique to derive some sort of wind field, either moving the beam or using some quasi-simultaneous beams. Um, and we're measuring the velocity, but as, as you probably should know, um, you can extract the electric field by that through this relationship where for our purposes in working with the data B is taken from the IGRF model. So again, going back to the motivation for this work, um, we talked about dual heating and the perturbation to satellites. Um, to, to determine satellite orbits and, and particularly space debris, the field of space debris orbits, we need good estimates of the neutral density. And from a space weather perspective, the, you know, one of the biggest impacts of, on that neutral density is the heating effect from things like dual heating, whereby um, you see um, molecular heating, which, which increases the, the, the iron temperature, which has a knock-on effect to the, the neutral temperature, vice versa can occur as well. Um, and also you can generate things like traveling ion spectrum disturbances, which are density perturbations, which travel outwards and, and also impact that, but it all boils down to, to the heating effect. And if that heating estimate that we're making is smearing over large scales, either temporal or spatial, we don't necessarily capture the full impact of the heating. Uh, and this was brought to light uh, by a number of authors, but I've picked out three here. 
Um, the first one was from Alan Roger in 2001, who did a study where they looked at comparing estimates of dual heating from hourly averaged electric field with six minute averages. And they found that made a median 20% difference in the calculation of the dual heating um, with an upper limit in the, in the study of about 40%. It, it varied throughout. So this, this is quite a, a, a big change. Um, it means that it was not capturing the full extent of the of, of the impact. Um, and thinking in terms of small scales, Dave Price in 2019 showed had a paper that showed that you can get significant neutral heating from auroral arcs, you know, at, at, at small scales, um, which, you know, uh, with his observations, I think he was using um, the Southampton ASC instruments as well as ISCAP, I think, um, you know, you're looking at very small um, regions of heating that could have potential to, to have a significant impact. And coming from a different perspective, Deng and Ridley, who, um, looking from the model perspective, they showed that just changing the model resolution from five degrees to 1.25 degree latitude change in their grids caused a 20% increase in their dual heating estimates. Um, and even then they acknowledged that they were using a, a averaged and smoothed empirical model of the electric field, which was also meant that this was probably an underestimate of the true effect. <laughs> so there, there are different reasons for, for wanting to, to look at the impact of the small scale and see, are we missing um, something when we're thinking in terms of the impact of space weather? <clears throat> um, Recent work using ISCAT has tended to rely on the monostatic technique because the tristatic technique is now reserved for the VHF and is slightly less um, um, effective for the moment. Uh, and also, as I mentioned before, the monostatic technique gives an indication of the neutral wind, um, which I would argue is not as good as extracting the neutral wind from some optical techniques that are available, but is at least a, a viable way of trying to account for that contribution. Um, I mentioned that other RSRs use something like the monostatic technique uh, to extract wind and, and electric field measurements, uh, and also other instruments. So I've, I've already mentioned um, SuperDAR, um, and that also, you know, it, it, when you look at the global scale, you're fitting to the to the data and you're averaging over space and time. It uses uh, 45 kilometer range gates. So I mean, I would argue it's still quite good. Um, because it has much better temporal averaging. Um, but you do get some comparable issues in terms of the sp spatial averaging. Um, and ISCAT now provides a new method for comparing the two techniques for determining this iron velocity in the ionosphere. Um, and so I thought, given that I was in the process of identifying whether, uh, whether the monostatic data was good enough to use, this was a good chance to, to test that and see how different that they actually were. Um, I've covered a lot of this already, but the two techniques are often considered interchangeable, but they are actually measuring two different regimes as, as we've mentioned. Um, and it's important to note the monostatic technique has been pointed out, this can act as a natural filter for, for small scale, spatial or temporal phenomena. Um, Phil Williams pointed this out back in 1990 after ISCAT had been operating for a just under a decade. Um, it's also worth pointing out the reverse, which of course is that the, the tristatic is a, a single point measurement and therefore you've got to be a bit careful because you could be missing rapid flows adjacent to your measurement, which, which you're not capturing in, the, in your data. So sometimes you may find that, that the, the monostatic data is seeing faster wind, if you like, or faster iron drift, if, if you like, um, but it's not as fast as it would be because it's small scale and it's over a longer time. Um, the measurement is over a longer time, but of course the, the, the tristatic measurement is only sampling that for a, for a fraction of the time and, and, and isn't actually picking it up. So the question is, do we see a difference at the MISA scale level? And I think the big question then becomes, how much does the measurement method affect the estimate of heating? So this is, if you think of Alan Rogers' work, this is taking it a step lower, if you like. He went from hours to minutes. This is going from minutes to 
well, minute, seconds perhaps, um, do we continue to see an improvement in the heating or a difference in the heating estimates? And to do this, we delved into the archive of ISCAP data, and particularly what's known as the Common Program 2. ISCAP runs a number of common programs. These are synoptic measurements scattered throughout the year. ISCAP unfortunately cannot run continuously um, due to well, the cost, essentially. Um, but it does make a number of, as well as bespoke experiments for users, it does make a number of uh, common programs for use of everybody. And these are synoptic, selected at different time of the years to build up a database, to build up um, um, a statistical uh, framework for, for looking at the, the data. And common program two is a scanning experiment, which dwells in uh, four directions uh, given here. These are the azimuth and the elevation of, of the pointing directions. It has a 360 second scan time with an average dwell time of 60 seconds. And from that archive from 1987 to 2005, um, we get about 70,000 tristatic data points and about 20,000 monostatic uh, data points. Um, and you can see how those data are spread in time. And I've put the solar cycle from sunspot number there is just as, as a guide to the when the measurements were made and you can see it's not particularly well distributed throughout the year and that's because there are other common program runs not cp2 cp there's actually cp1 through to seven um which means that some of these gaps would actually be running different types of experiment um but if we look in mlt there's there's a good spread of data pretty much across all mlt a slight bias um, in the afternoon sector. Um, but there's quite a significant amount of data to be used. Um, oh, I should say, that, and these are these are data that I've deemed usable based on um, uh, reasonable uncertainties. You can go and look at the paper to see how I defined reasonable. Um, but the, the uncertainty associated with the measurements, the error on the, on the, on the measurement, um, and um, also ensuring that we were only looking at data where there were, was a full monostatic scan available and we, we didn't have bad data at times. So our measurement height is in the F region with bins, uh, range uh, bins centered at 240 to 255 kilometers and those, those are gated, they're about 20 to 30 kilometers wide gates and that's because the scale size of the ionosphere at that height is quite large. Um, we ensured that the tristatic interaction height always lay within the range of the monostatic measurement. We're not actually looking at any points that are separated in altitude. In effect, it, unless we were pointing into the E region down at sort of 100, 100 to 180, 200 kilometers, that wouldn't matter too much, but we did ensure that it was within the um, height range. Um, I should note that the CP2 measurements did actually continue on to, to 2012, the tristatic measurements, but in 2012, it switched to the VHF and the VHF cannot scan. So we no longer had um, uh, simultaneous measurements. That was part of the motivation really looking beyond 2012. Um, were the, um, the, could I use the monostatic measurements rather than the tristatic measurements for, for what I wanted to do? Um, and, you can access ISCAT data from um, several places. Um, there's ISCAT's own archive hosted by Madrigal. Um, the UK, we maintain an archive um, which you can access via the web, and we have recently ported that to CEDA, um, and you should be able to access it by via Jasmine in the near future. We're currently working on that to make access easier for everyone. Um, but I've actually used data that has been processed by my Japanese colleagues and there's an archive at NIPR and the reason I've done that is that they actually have uh, processed um, velocity measurements um, which are easily accessible and I wanted to work with Yasunobu so it seemed a good opportunity to do that. So let's get into the data. So if we look at the, the bulk motion the top panel over here shows the probability distribution functions of the velocity for the three uh, velocity components, eastward, northward, and upward. Uh, the blue lines are the monostatic measurements and the orange lines are the tristatic measurements. And I'll try and keep to that convention throughout the presentation. Um, 
And there's a couple of things to note. One is that there's a there's a small differences, broadly the same, but small differences in the um, in the distributions, particularly around the the peak. And this, of course, is then reflected in the tails. The tristatic has much broader tails in the distribution. It's measuring um, potentially higher velocities. Um, you'll also notice that. Um, for the certainly for the um, eastward component, I've cut it off. The data does actually extend further on for, for all of them, but I've, I've chopped it off at about 2,000 um, uh, meters per second. Now, you might argue that some of these flows are fast, but I, but recent work and, and not so recent work by Anita IKO in Finland and co authors have shown comparisons with satellite data, I, I think Swarm, that have shown. Um, that you do get flow channels of exceptionally high velocity. So I, what I didn't want to do was artificially crop um, the data off in my statistics. So it could be that some of these values are unrealistic, but some of them will be real. Um, and the next set of plots, this is for the tristatic, this is for the monostatic, and all I've done is split these probability distributions up by magnetic local time to look at the overall bulk picture. And it's kind of what you'd expect with ISCAP rotating under the convection pattern. Um, we see a, 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 if we just look at the eastward component, we see a change in the in the general distribution. But the distributions are actually very wide. At any given time, uh, any given local time, you could actually get quite a range of, of um, a velocity estimate within that less so around around noon but certainly towards midnight it's it's very broad um and the yellow white and blue lines are sort of guiding the eye so the yellow line is the median the white line is the mean and the blue line is the weighted mean so that's essentially i've taken the the data and weighted it by the associated error uh, to calculate the mean uh, so that brings some measure of the uncertainty into keep us honest really to make sure that we're not relying on data points that you know of i don't know 300 meters per second with errors of 600 meters per second um which doesn't happen very often but it can happen um so we can see that the the there's actually quite good agreement between the two the, the this is kind of reassuring we're seeing the bulk motion represented equally well with both techniques which i think is is Reassuring. I think if there had been glaring differences, it would have been quite worrying. Um, but as I've already mentioned, the tristatic distribution is heavier tailed. So it could be that it's more responsive to faster streams. Um, it could be due to the small spatial temporal scales involved. So there are differences, but overall, there, there's similarities. But it's interesting, as I mentioned, there's a wide distribution at a given local time. But what makes this up? And the one thing we're not considered is, of course, is this is all for all levels of geomagnetic activity or solar wind driving. What happens if we break that up a bit? And if we do that, we get something like this. So what I've done here, are I have split the um, IMF from Omni um, delayed to the ion sphere and with this added delay through the ions, uh, through the magnetic delay to the bow shock with an added delay to the ionosphere. And I split it up into quadrants where we have a northward, a southward, and uh, an eastward and a westward uh, quadrant. This is northward, this is southward, east and west. And the little dial plots here show the, the amount of data in each bin. And what we've done is we've averaged the data. So these are hourly averages of the monostatic and the tristatic, again, blue and orange in the same format. Um, and you can immediately see that there are there are differences. Please note the, the scale size here. Um, this the, the velocities under northward are somewhat smaller than under southward. Um, and these are clocks. So this is uh, noon, this is midnight, dawn, and dusk. Uh, and so you can see how the um, velocity rotates, the velocity direction changes as, as you rotate around. Um, so in the northward IMF, we see large differences in both direction and magnitude, and that varies throughout uh, MLT. There's not massive consistency in when that occurs. Um, uh, certainly not something we've looked at in great detail. It's enough to say that it, there is that variation, though the absolute magnitude change is relatively small, with some exceptions, such as here. Um, 
For the Southwood IMF, it's more ordered. Um, we've got small deviations in, in direction, um, small changes in magnitude. Um, and you could argue this is you know, very consistent with strong driving from some steady reconnection. You, you're, you're getting a, a strong pattern um, occurring. So I think that's what we're seeing there. So overall, in the Northwood case, we've got um, more variability in the difference between the tristatic and the monostatic. And for the Southwood case, we've got consistent but small differences in VT and VM in these averages. And again, I, I, I'll come back to this, but these are hourly averages um, binned by MLT. Well, um, so why are we seeing bigger differences for Northwood than for Southwood? Well, I sort of kind of hinted at it with this strong driving um, as it was one potential difference. Um, Gary Abel back in 2009 used SuperDARM data to assess the effect of the IMF on the ionospheric velocity um, by looking at pairs of range gates at different scales. So he, he did, did a comparison. Uh, it's a paper, it's a paper and the collected papers around it are well worth reading. Um, but he looked across scales of about 45 to 1200 kilometers. And he also found that generally the, the, the structure was similar for all directions of the IMF except the northward IMF direction. When the IMF was strongly northward, um, there were different velocity fluctuations compared to other directions. Um, and he attributed this to the influence of solar wind driving in all cases except that strongly northward IMF, where essentially um, it's decoupled from the, the solar wind. Um, one caveat is that those observations were on open field lines and our data is from predominantly closed field lines, so that there could be different physics and mechanisms in play. Um, or at least some uh, modification of it. Um, but could this be the same effect that we're seeing here? I think I think it's it's certainly possible. Uh, but again, it's important to note these are on those average scales. These are quite moderately small differences, but significant. So we've looked at the the bulk motion. What about if we delve into the small scale motion? So go below those one hour averages and actually look at the data at the the cadence it's taken. So um, in September two thousand and five, there was a quasi continuous twenty day run of the ice gate UHF using CP two, and these data have been looked at for different purposes by other authors. Um, and here, what I've done is I've presented one day of that. This is the thirteenth of September two thousand and five. The top two plots. This shows the Omni data delayed um, to the um, magnetosphere and to the ionosphere. And we can see that predominantly for this day, there was a southward IMF and there was a swing in the east-west of, of the east-west component of the IMF. And then later in the day, there was some northward with some southward excursion. So it was, it was a day of varied activity. Below that is the IE index. This is uh, calculated from the local image magnetometers. Um, so it's uh, equivalent to the AE index, but it's local. And again, you can see that there are bursts of activity occurring, often associated with, with changes in the IMF as we're seeing different um, driving occurring. And the three panels here show the um, eastward, northward, and upward components. And each orange um, cross is uh, data from tristatic. Green is the monostatic, and sorry, uh, blue is the monostatic, and green is a new value I've introduced called the average tristatic. Uh, all we've done there is we've averaged the, the tristatic measurements across a monostatic scan, so we have something on a similar cadence for comparison. It's interesting to note if you look, compare the PDFs, it does actually um, bring them closer together, but there's still uh, differences in the distributions. But immediately you should be able to see it. So in, at this point here, we've got some rather um, uh, strong variability in the tristatic um, with moderate variability in, in, the, in the monostatic in the average tristatic. Uh, but the, the tristatic tends to see uh, much more variability. I think you can see this more in the nautical component um, where we see a larger spread of, of orange dots than blue dots. Um, so the overall trend is the same, but we see a lot more variability on the background. And that kind of makes sense that the trend would be the same because it's the same bulk motion that we've talked about already. 
but here we're actually getting at the underlying variability. Um, very quickly, we take a small detour so to consider all the differences between the tristatic and the monostatic important. Um, essentially, you know, each measurement has an error estimate associated with it. Are we actually looking at measurements that are broadly the same because they lie within the error bounds of each other? Um, and we can test that. Um, and uh, just for reference, here is um, uh, the distribution of errors for the monostatic and tristatic for the northward component. So this is the PDF of the velocity, just cut off slightly differently from before, different bin scales. And we can see the also the distribution of the of the of the error, and we see that the the uncertainty on the um, uh, the tristatic does tend to be uh, much larger than the monostatic at higher speeds, though the relative uh, error is actually nearly identical for both. Um, but we can compare, we can compare the, the um, certainly the, the average tristatic um, with, the, with the monostatic on the same time scale and look at the amount of overlap. You can also do, I did it with the tristatic as well in a slightly different way. Um, and we can see that um, for different uh, orders of n where n is, um, if you like multiples of the uncertainty or multiples of the standard deviation, um, we see that within one um, one step of uncertainty, one error bound, it's sixty percent of the data does not overlap, roughly speaking. Um, and then if you extend that and say, okay, well that's just you know that that one standard deviation will not cover the enough of the distribution to, to, to make that reasonable. So if we move to two, um, we, we dropped to about 30%. And I've not shown you, but if you go down, if you go to three, which should go well beyond the bounds, it's, it's something like 15%. So there's still quite a lot of data which lies outside. They are separated more than the, their uncertainties would suggest. So I would argue that yes, the differences between them are important. Um, and we can look at these in a slightly different way. So this is the same time interval as before. I put the IE index up for, for reference. And we can see that um, the, the black dots represent the difference. That's the monostatic minus the average tristatic. And the shaded region is a measure of the variability of the tristatic measurement within a single scan, within a single monostatic scan. Um, and you can see that there's big differences during active periods. And these are actually moderately correlated with times when there's large variability, which kind of makes sense. Uh, correlation coefficient is about 0.6. Um, so there's a decent correlation there between the two. Um, and fundamentally, the larger differences in the two techniques are linked to periods when the tristatic experiences large variability on short time scales. Um, but this is somewhat at odds with the earlier observation. The earlier observation from the bulk motion showed it was northward IMF, essentially less active. I could have I could have replaced this plot with with IMF data, and you would have seen the, the correlation as you saw earlier. But the northward IMF saw bigger differences. But here we're seeing southward IMF producing bigger differences, more active periods producing bigger differences. Um, and why would that be? Well, I think it's because the bulk observations involve significant averaging of the data, so we're still seeing effectively two different effects um, where we're seeing that passing on of the intermittency of the solar wind um, via solar wind driving, um, which causes the northward IMF effect. But when you get right down to the small scales, um, those are masked by the averages. Um, and so the, there's still that level of variability. And it makes sense. This is one of the things we wanted to look at. Alan Roger went from hours to, to minutes and saw a difference. And we went, we were looking at hours a few minutes ago. So if we throw in all the data from the period, um, you can see uh, um, the probability distribution functions represented at color scale here, MLT up the side and the difference across the bottom. So this is for northward, this is for southward IMF. Um, this is the variability of the tristatic measurement. Um, and as you can see, there is an MLT dependence and there's also a IMF dependence. You get much broader distribution of southward IMF. You get, um, more likely to get data across a wider range of velocities for southward IMF than you are for northward. Um, and similarly, 
the level of oh sorry the white lines are just the um, um weighted means just to help draw the eye if you like um and as you can see they're not fully representative of the data spread um again we see the same with the with the variables of the tristatic where we have much more activity on the night side than on the day side which fits with some of the other observations before uh, and the possible explanation here is that you know we're the tristatic is responding to these short duration spatially confined flows which is missed by the larger monostatic measurement um and these you know there are lots of candidates from for these from um short bursts associated with the rural intensifications and slightly longer duration bursty bulk flows the answer is full of uh, rapid flow channels and, and bursty flows that have an impact on the on the local velocity. Uh, and again, Phil Williams in eighty nine described short bursts of plasma velocity during substorms from ice scale observations. Um, and he actually found that in a follow up paper that these were tended to be short lived, three to seven minutes, which is within or under the scan size of the radar occasionally. So it's not always well detected by the monostatic mode. And they were found all across the night side. So that fits very well with what we're seeing here. So rapidly switching to the impact on dual heating, we go back to our um, uh, period in September and we saw that there's a moderate Germanic storm from about the 8th to the 17th of September, followed by quieter conditions. And this lets us look at two different periods of, of the impact on dual heating. We go back to our equation we can actually oversimplify that calculation and just look at the ionospheric component and here uh, sigma p is the height integrated conductivity which we've also got from our ice cap observations um so i'm ignoring in this instance the neutral component which is a very dangerous thing to do because the neutral motion of the atmosphere is highly important for determining the absolute heating values and it's a mistake i think that's been made over the years by a number of authors um where we just tended to say it's it's zero or, or not worth considering but actually I, I would argue it is very worth considering however here we're comparing two methods over the same time interval where estimates of the neutral motion are effectively going to be the same and on that basis um i am electing to ignore it just for simplicity's sake here at the moment but i will circle back to it so the plot on the left now shows the weighted means of uh, the dual heating the, the mean dual heating rates as a function of magnetic local time for um the storm period and for the non-storm quieter period again the um blue line is for monostatic orange line is for the tristatic and we see there are quite large differences throughout the day at various times um but particularly in the morning sector um such that the for the storm time the relative difference is about 52 percent. so that means that that the monostatic is about 0.48 or 48% of the of the of the tristatic measurement. Um, and for the non-storm, um, it's it improves, it's capturing more of more of the measurement, if you like, if, if one assumes the tristatic is accurate, you get 64%. Um, so there's definitely a big difference there just by looking at two velocity techniques from the same instrument. Um, and there's quite good levels of data in in in, in each one, in each bin. Um, for clarity, here are the, the median values, and I've separated them off by storm, and you can actually see uh, the local time effect. It's much more important, I would argue, in the morning, because we have the, the interquartile range overlaps strongly in the afternoon sector, such that um, although there looks like there's some small differences in reality, um, um, it, it's seeing pretty much the same. But as you move into, into, into midnight and across midnight into the morning, we see a bigger difference. Um, coming back to the neutral wind measurement, we know that there is a uh, an MLT and a geomagnetic activity dependence. This has been worked out by previous authors, um, such that in the morning sector, the heating rates under medium to high activity can be increased by 20 to 30 percent. It can also decrease at other times. Um, and if you take the worst case scenario, um, and take 30% uh, uplift, then the relative drop difference drops to about 46% of, of, um, of the tristatic estimate um, relative to the monostatic technique. So that's basically um, QM is only 54% of, of, of QT. 
Um, so even then, it's still appreciable, even when you factor in the, the neutral effect. Um, so we can see that these small scales and the, or certainly the variability makes a big difference um, to our estimates of, of the heating. Uh, and we can go a step further and we can actually, for example, for these periods, calculate the actual ionospheric dual heating. And again, these are indicative as they neglect the neutral wind effect. Um, but we can see that there's a, a, a moderately significant difference between the, the the, the tristatic and the monostatic measurements, um, uh, both for storm time and for uh, non-storm time. In fact, interesting, the non-storm time, um, it's, uh, in this case, it's actually um, um, failing to capture more of the, um, um, of the tristatic measurement, though the, the numbers are, of course, significantly smaller, which makes a big difference. So, Concluding, what have we done? We've compared simultaneous iron velocity estimates across two different scales using the ISCAP uh, radars and using data from the extensive archive. Um, and we were pleased to see that the bulk motion was represented well by both, which was reassuring. But we saw that there were differences um, in the local time averages under northward IMF conditions which we think are attributed to this strong solar wind driving for non northward conditions. Um, when we go to much smaller scales and do a compa direct comparison of the velocities, um, we see um, significant differences that vary with MLT of several hundred meters per second on the, on the night side, um, which are, again, consistent with small scale flow bursts in the ionosphere, though I think there's, a, well, there's more to be done on that. Um, in terms of the dual heating, there are significant differences from using the two techniques for comparing it on a local scale. Um, looking at a particular interval, we show that um, there's an MLT and geomagnetic activity on the dual heating difference, not just on the on the level of heating. We knew that already, but there's a, a dependence for the difference between them. Um, and so the, the greater temporal variability measured by the tristatic tri technique leads to a moderate increase on the local estimate of dual heating. And further study is warranted to properly establish the cause of this. I think more, more work's to be done. And speaking of future work, one way we can do that is using the ISCAP 3D radar. Uh, this is going to replace the UHF and the VHF. It's going to be a, uh, a phased array radar, so there are no slow moving parts, no big dishes anymore. This is the site map at Shebotten, um, showing the distribution of these tessellating panels, which lock together to build hundreds of antennas. Um, but it has a number of capabilities far beyond what we can do with the current system. It has multiple beams produced quasi simultaneously, uh, which means we can get full vector measurements at multiple locations simultaneously. Uh, it will have a much higher power transmitter, which will reduce the, um, the, the um, increase the resolution of the data because we won't have to integrate for as long. In theory, it can have continuous unattended operations, though that depends on money. Um, you'll be able to do interferometry with it. Um, you'll be able to nest experiments within each other and run different experiments simultaneously because you can do rapid switching between both beams and uh, pulse, pulse codes. Uh, and there'll be the option to do low versus high duty cycle to, to, to do long-term monitoring, we hope. Um, so it's going to be a highly versatile, highly useful um, um, experiment. Um, and one of the things that I, I touched on there is this volumetric imaging of the velocity field. So uh, you'll be able to do direct comparisons with the 3D pattern of the plasma structure. You'll be able to image this, this image here, for example, is from AMISER, um, which is kind of does a little bit of this, but nowhere near as much um, in terms of resolution. Um, notice the time there it took to produce all those different beam positions. Um, so we'll be able to resolve the spatial image of small scale flow bursts um, and relate them to the structures in the, the rural structures that, that we're observing um, in 3D. Um, and also obviously conduct experiments to assess the velocity at different spatial and temporal scales by careful averaging across the, the beams. 
um, will be able to establish the spatial distribution of dual heating and therefore assess the overall impact and significance of small scale variability and how that applies to um, expanding it to global scales and how we should fit that into our large scale observations through modifying um, space weather models or, or introducing the, the physics required to, to capture it into the models, uh, which of course is relevant to all the swimmer people who aren't here this morning, but hopefully we'll be watching this in the future. Um, and I think that's everything. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me this morning. Cool, thank you, Andrew. Let me just get you a clap. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I think it has been a very great seminar. Actually, I enjoy very much, and I think I will use some of your um, slides for my teaching course next year, next term, actually. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, it has been really an excellent seminar. So thank you very much. And uh, now we have time for questions. So is there any question for Andrew? Just um, just open your mic and, and ask the question. I have the list of participants in here. Actually, you we were worried because of this swimmer meeting at the same time, but there has been 30 people connected. So no, that's not bad. Yes, yeah, I think I've stunned them all into silence though. Good. So questions? Okay, no questions. No, it was excellently. <laughs> Actually, regarding the ASCAT 3D, so when it will be totally in operation? The antennas are on a ship and are due to dock in Tromso within this month. And then depending on the weather, they will be deployed at Shibotan this year. Um, and once that happens, we can begin operations partway through next year. Okay. Um, and then there will be a, a period of, of, of sort of growth of the system as we increase transmitters and, and build the remote sites such that I would hope by the end of next year, we would have a fully um, operational phase one of the radar. Phase one of the radar is at about um, three megawatts, I think. And phase two will lift that up to is it five or 10, I can't remember, megawatts. Um, and we also have capability to expand the um, the array to make it bigger to in increase the coverage of the beams. But yeah, next year we are hoping, but we are very dependent on the weather. Cool. Okay, so Jim, while asking the chat, will you be at the swimmer meeting, Andrew? <laughs> I won't, unfortunately. I have um, too many other things to do. <laughs> um, it's. Uh, Report, um, it's reporting time for the ISCAT support group um, and we have to get it submitted by Thursday and the person who um, usually leads the reporting is funnily enough leading the swimmer meeting so someone else has to do it instead <laughs> so that would be me cool. there's another I... question by Maria Wallat uh, you said that the operations are dependent on funding what are the limitations there as currently planned that's a good question and one we don't really have an answer to at the moment. Um, we have the ISCAT symposium the other week and there was a lot of talk about this and the problem is we're not really going to know as much as we want to know until we switch it on. Um, but the biggest um, limit on funding is the amount of money that's provided by the associate countries to run the radar and though that hasn't gone up in over a dec decade. Japan has just committed to adding more money into the system, um, but no one else has done yet. Um, so that puts a, a moderate limitation on it. Uh, we know we can run a low duty cycle. By low duty cycle, I should try and explain that a little bit. What that means is that we would not be using it to its full capability, but we would still have a system that was better than what we have now. So even though it, it's, it sounds like it's worse, but it's actually still better than what we currently have, but it wouldn't have all the whistles and bells running at low duty cycle. And one of the options is potentially to run more synoptic observations at low duty cycle and then reserve the high duty cycle for, uh, for um, much higher um, resolution experiments. The, the experiments that we as a community put forward in our grants and in our direct access to, to, to look at specific things. 
Cool. So I see another uh, question uh, this time from Matt Taylor. So you mentioned the lovely Swarm spacecraft. Yeah. Is there something to do there in terms of cross comparison linking in situ with remote sensing and perhaps Absolutely. future L uh, LEO spacecraft like G uh, GDC on NASA side? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, for example, Swarm, ISCAT actually currently runs what's called all associate time, where we all pull, all the countries pull a little bit of our time to support conjunctions between Swarm and ISCAT. So someone calculates when Swarm is going to be close to ISCAT or, or, or close to the beam, and we make sure the radar is switched on for a number of these passes. And this is also being done in conjunction with the Japanese Arase satellite. Um, and so there are a number of colleagues, predominantly, I think, in Sweden and Japan who have been working on, um, oh, and, and Finland, sorry, working on uh, combined observations of um, swarm measurements and, and, um, and ISCAP uh, and Arase. Um, I, I mentioned briefly Anita Ikeo, and she has some um, uh, postdocs and PhD students, I think, working on intercomparisons of the ISCAP velocity measurements or the iron drift velocity measurements with um the swarm measurements um and there, there's i think still a lot more to do there there's been lots of stuff done on pulsating aurora with swarm and, and with arase um with icecap um beyond that there's icecap is actually always open to people coming to us and suggesting um devoting time for experiments via several routes um and one mission i'm particularly excited for is the smile mission which is slightly different it's not so much an in in situ conjunction but in terms of multi-scale observations smile is going to bring some fantastic observations of large-scale auroral features which which iscat will sit within and take us down to much smaller scale observations um and i'm particularly excited to see that come through in the future good so any other question i mean you can write in the chat or also open your mic directly Okay, I don't think. I think that's it. That's it. Well, Brilliant. thank you. Thank you again, Andrew. I think it has been really like a very excellent seminar. <laughs> thank you so much for for that. And thank I will you. stop the recording now here. And I, I, um, uh, I want to just remind everyone that we have the seminars on Tuesdays, the first Tuesday of the month uh, at 11 UK time. So we don't know yet who will be our next speaker, but I will send the advertisement uh, as soon as we know for next month. So save the day. Cool. So thank you everyone for being here and yeah, see you next month. Bye.